can. Yes. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Um, I couldn't be actually more excited to be talking to you all about slime molds and having an opportunity to share some of my enthusiasm for that. So um, as Anne said, my name is Kathleen Thompson, and I am a fourth year PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the botany department um, studying fungi, which is sort of the overall theme for this year's um, Wisconsin Science Festival, which is just so cool. I was so excited to hear that. Um, so I want to, in some ways, go along along with that theme um, in talking about slime molds, but I'll, I'll also highlight a sort of major reason why that actually deviates from our theme here a bit as well. So, so stay tuned. Um, but overall, what this talk is going to be about is sort of a, a general introduction, if you will, to slime molds, a little bit about who they are, actually a lot about who they are, um, a bit about what they do, and also how to spot them if you're interested in finding them, finding them for yourself. All right, so like I said, I want to spend some time talking about who they are, because I think Perhaps some of you that are joining this talk um, are already familiar with slime molds, maybe very familiar with slime molds, um, but I imagine there's at least some of you out there who joined this talk because perhaps you've seen those words, but you're not quite sure what these organisms are. And that's quite common actually, uh, because they're not something we talk about very often. And in fact, they're not necessarily something we encounter or realize we're encountering very often either. Um, but with that, I also wanna talk about what slime molds are not. So, my impression, usually when I'm talking to people about slime molds, because I do so frequently, as you might expect, um, oftentimes people think that these are synonymous with molds, like the same kind of mold that you would find growing on your old bread or strawberries or down in your damp basement. But actually, that's not the case. Um, slime molds get their name for a totally different reason, which we'll highlight here in a bit. Um, but they're not actually at all related to those kind of molds. For a long time, though, scientists considered slime molds to be fungi, right? They were actually grouped pretty similarly with things like molds, like the ones that you would find on your bread, which I have shown in this picture here, kind of up into the top left. So you can see what that looks like. It has these long sort of stalks or stems that they grow on. And then the top has this round head that spores come out of that they use to disperse to new habitats and new substrates. And it looks pretty darn similar to that picture of Comatrichia nigra that I have in the bottom right, which is a slime mold, right? They look super similar. So for a long time, uh, we thought that these were fungi and they were considered to be fungi and studied by mycologists. And that signature is actually still pretty true today as well. Um, and this is also kind of a, um, a result of like the visible part of their life cycle being very fungal-like, like I've shown you here. In fact, in May of 1973, a particular slime mold actually gained uh, national attention in the New York Times. Um, there was this giant alien-like blob, as it was described, growing in Marie Harris's backyard in Dallas, Texas. And it was, it was covered on national news and everything as well, and the blob looked something like this. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen something that looks like that in your yard or around Madison as well. And in fact, this is actually part of the blurb um, from either May 31st or 30th, it looks like it can't decide here, um, talking about how this blob was determined by two Texas scientists uh, to be something that was at that point dead and probably not to return. Um, but a particular botanist at Baylor um, called this so-called blob a common slime mold and actually referred to it at that point as a lower fungus, which in a more modern concept, we, we don't necessarily accept. So, these slime molds have been sort of seen in different if, different contexts here, but often very confused and viewed as being alien-like and something totally extraterrestrial. And perhaps some of you, I wish I could see your hands here, um, perhaps some of you have seen something like that in your own yard as well, right? This kind of yellow, maybe kind of mustard blob that emerges just seemingly out of nowhere. Oftentimes they can be found in lawns or particularly mulch beds. If you live downtown Madison, they are everywhere in the mulch beds around here. Maybe it's looked a little bit more something like this, it becomes a little more tan in color as it dries out. Well, congratulations, folks. You've seen at least one slime mold in your life, um, perhaps more. So this one here is one of my favorites, mostly be given its, its common name uh, as a dog person here. This is Fuligoseptica, 
And its common name is dog vomit slime mold. And perhaps you can put together why that looks like the case here. So why do we consider these organisms to be so unknown and so strange? Why do we, why was that sort of um, idea that it was this extraterrestrial alien blob that was taking over Dallas, Texas? Um, why does that come to mind? Um, well, partially is because they spend most of their life cycle in forms that we can't see. So these aren't like organisms that we feel like we're interacting with on a daily basis, like plants or even like fungi, right? That we can see mushrooms that pop up certain seasons or something. Slime molds are, are even a little bit different than that. Um, they spend most of their life cycle in ways that we can't see, but also in forms that, that we're not necessarily totally familiar with all the time either. They seem to just emerge out of nowhere. But they also, if I may do it a little bit differently than most organisms that we're familiar with as well. Um, so they're not necessarily, in terms of their life cycle, it doesn't necessarily look at all like a plant. It looks somewhat like a fungus, but there's also parts of it that are somewhat animal-like. So they fall into this weird kind of unknown category given the main sort of blocks of life that we think of. If we're mostly familiar with plants and animals and fungi, these don't necessarily fall into any of those groups. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But what I wanna do is highlight some of the life cycle as to why, why that is. So what I'm gonna show you is the life cycle of a plasmodial slime mold. Um, and this particular species is Physarum polycephalum. So if you're familiar at all with slime molds in the news in popular science articles, you may know this species actually yourself. So we'll start here with the plasmodial stage. As you can see, oh, I guess I can't use a laser pointer on here, can I? Um, we'll start with the plasmodium because it's generally the first visible stage that we as humans might interact with, right? It's this big kind of blobby substrate that essentially appears out of nowhere if it's in a mulch bed or something. Um, and it might be the first, the first piece that we see. So this is what some of those can look like in actual picture, not just sketch forms. Um, like I said, this is where the, or excuse me, I haven't said this yet. This is where the slime mold gets the slime part of its name, is that certain species have this plasmodium that might actually become visible uh, to the human eye and, and come out of its substrate. And that's where the slimy part comes from for the most part. Um, this one on the left here is a particular type of plasmodium uh, that's really hard to see. So this is a really impressive picture that I did not take. This is from Melkor, who lives in Svalbard, um, growing on a leaf here, and it's really tiny. But these other two on the left are ones that I took uh, between Wisconsin and Iowa. So these are ones that, that are growing and living in, in areas, if you're tuning in from the Midwest as well, around you. Um, oops, if I go back here. So these are particularly interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, as you can see, we can see these with our naked eye, right? Even the one that's sort of small on the left-hand side. But essentially what these are, are they're giant single cells that are full of a ton of nuclei or little genetic centers of DNA. So we have these big cells that are actually moving around and coordinating. So we may see it on the log eating those mushrooms at one point in time, but if you were to come back hours later, that giant yellow mass would actually have moved on that log um, and they can do so pretty quickly. All right, so starting with that plasmodium, there's another step on there as well that I didn't mention last time. These things can be really resist resistant to environmental change. Uh, so if conditions are not right, they can form something called sclerotium, which are essentially hardened little masses that remain dormant until, until conditions improve. But they can actually also, if conditions are in the right state, they can start to form what are called fruiting bodies. So in this case, for Physarum polycephalum, those fruiting bodies are called sporangia or sporangium if we're talking about just a, a single one. And I've included a real life picture of that so you can kind of make the connection between the sketch and what they actually look like in real life. It's a pretty good, pretty good depiction there. Um, so this is what these look like. They essentially, that plasmodium will sort of kind of constrict up into these tree-like structures. And at the top is where they're producing those spores. And I show you one example here, but these fruiting bodies can actually look a variety of different ways. And this is where, this is the part that we as humans would interact with the most. This is where they become visible to our eye. And they give us quite a display actually of colors and textures and patterns 
and structures that are just truly amazing. Um, this is obviously only a little bit here. This was a, a kind of picture collage taken from an article written by the New York Times. Uh, but I encourage you, if you haven't yet, to just Google image slime molds and just spend some time clicking through there because it's just amazing. And if you are interested in finding them, that's a really good way to sort of hone your eye into what kind of um, structures and colors that you would be looking for as well. Do note though that I don't have a scale bar on these as well. These are super, super tiny little things. So hopefully throughout some of the pictures, there will be some kind of little size markers and you can see, see what we're talking about here. So I'm going to spend the next few slides leading you through a couple different general types of fruiting bodies that we see in slime molds as well. If you're a terminology person or a science person, maybe you'll find this particularly interesting. I know I actually do definitely like to do this, but um, some of you, if that's not your thing, hopefully the pictures will be just as enticing. So the first one I'm gonna start with is sporangia. Now the term sporangia with that IA at the end means that it's plural, meaning I'm talking about all of those little pink fruiting bodies. If I'm just talking about one, it's called a sporangium. Um, obviously very nuanced here, but what I'm showing you here is Arceria denudata, which I've spelled incorrectly on that slide, denudata with an A on the end, uh, and this is the cotton candy slime mold, um, which hopefully that picture on the right there shows you how it got its cute little common name. So this is one that grows around the Midwest as well. Uh, the color can vary between being that sort of kind of like peachy to pink color to really like a dusty rose. It has a little bit of variability, but overall it's these adorable little fuzzy pink fingers that just pop out of wood. Um, and you usually find them, I guess, probably in like the early to midsummer, I believe. So sporangia are different from other types of fruiting bodies. Because in this case, when that plasmodium is sort of creeping within that wood or on top of that wood, um, feeding on bacteria and fungi, if the conditions are right for it to start fruiting, what will happen is that plasmodium will break into sort of individual pieces. The, each little piece will contract into itself and it'll build that little stalk-like um, stalk -like structure. And they're usually clustered for this reason. You can see that they're kind of in, on the left-hand side, they're in little clusters, but a little bit spread out as well. It really depends on how that constricting uh, takes place and what little pieces it breaks into. Most of them are on little stalks, as you can see better in the right picture, um, but they can also be sessile, meaning that they're just sort of flat and attached to the substrate as well. And they can come in tons of colors and tons of different shapes and even be iridescent, so where the outsides are coated in certain crystals that reflect the light and they look really glittery and rainbow and they're just adorable. So here, if I can get this to work, I have a video for you. So this is a time-lapse video of the plasmodium itself has already sort of constricted, but what you're going to be able to watch is it continue to constrict into individual sporangia that then develop um, to their sort of final state in color. So you can see it takes on that really dark kind of reddish hue to brown. And that's a common thing among slime molds as well, is that their colors will vary throughout their, throughout even, of course, their whole life cycle, but even within that um, fruiting body developmental stage, you can get a variety of different colors. So this is another type of fruiting body called an athalia. So athalia being multiple actually, like if I'm talking about the picture on the left, if I'm talking about the picture on the right, we'd call that an athallium because it's a single one. Um, but these are a little bit different. Um, so instead of the plasmodium breaking into little pieces that then individually constrict, in this case the whole plasmodium for the most part will sort of constrict into one, into one sort of um, fruiting body. Now that's a little bit different once we when we're talking about the species on the left-hand side, like a Gala epidendrum or the wolf smoke slime mold, that one sort of breaks into big pieces and then each of those actually constrict into this particular shape. So like with everything in biology, the rules uh, are not always hard and fast. There's a lot of sort of in between on a lot of these things, but um, in general, they tend to be hemispherical uh, or sort of spherical shaped and sessile, meaning they're attached to the substrate like this. So they look just kind of like blobs, right? Like big circular, circular blobs on the substrate. 
Um, the one on the left, like a Gullah epidendrum, is one that you can, that is relatively commonly found around here. And it's super cool because when it's young, it's really bubblegum pink. Um, and if you were to pop any of those, it's like Pepto-Bismol that shoots out of there. But as they age, they become that darker brown. Um, and if you were to pop those open, depending on what stage they're at, if they're fully developed, they'll actually have these really beautiful brown kind of mauve colored spores inside. So um, those are a super fun one. The one on the right, that's an image that I actually took from social media. Believe it or not, I follow uh, slime mold groups, uh, as I know you all probably do as well, right? Hopefully after this. So this is an image from Alita Jonquil. This is the largest reticularia like a perdon that I've ever seen in my life. So that was uh, particularly cool. Another example of an athallium or athalia, if we're talking about many here, is that dog vomit slime mold that we talked about at the beginning. The one that caused such a scene in 1973 in Texas in Marie Harris's backyard. Um, this is our dog vomit slime mold. And this is one, you know, usually about that, that time of the year, once summer hits, I don't know how many, I wish I had a dollar for every picture that I receive from, from people of these growing in their mulch beds or in their yard being like, what is this? What kind of mushroom is this? And I'm like, not a mushroom, it's a slime mold, even better. <laughs> so, so we have this, this lovely slime mold here and here's my guilty looking dog trying to tell me that it's not her vomit, right? Um, but you can see that one is a little bit hard to tell, this large one that's on the left-hand side. But the one on the right looks a lot more like that typical athallium, the round kind of cushion shaped. And I've included this as well. So you can see this connection in some ways between what the plasmodium looks like. So that's the plasmodium of Philogoseptica growing on wood and it's bright yellow and gelatinous, but it eventually when conditions are right and it's come to the surface like that, it will constrict up into its athallium fruiting body. Another type here is called a pseudo athalia. So pseudo meaning fake, athalia meaning the, the fruiting body we were talking about previously. So in this case, what we have are fruiting bodies that are actually formed from individual little sporangia. The first type we talked about is so here we're connecting sporangia, athalia into sort of this new type of fruiting body called a pseudothalia. Um, we have individual sporangia, but they're so tightly clustered together that they sort of look like and in some ways function like an athalium. So this is a particularly cute one called Tubifera ferruginosa, the raspberry slime mold. And the picture on the left I took a number of years ago in Iowa, and you can see the quality of my iPhone at that point in time was not nearly uh, apparently what Mark Bauer has here on the right side, but I included that one so you could see those sporangia a little bit better as well. Here's another example of one that I've included also. This one I took actually up in the UP in 2019. Um, so the picture on the left, you can see those individual sporangial structures a little bit better, but the one on the right is so cool because there's two of them growing so close together, but at different developmental stages. So the one that's bright yellow was still pretty young, and the one on the left within that picture that's brown had, had moved a lot further within its development um, and was getting to the point where it was probably going to produce spores soon. So. Um, another super cool example, and once again, maybe not right in our backyard, the UP is a little bit of a drive, but um, within our neck of the woods for sure. And the final one here, which is like my favorite probably, just because I have only seen it one time in real life and only received one picture of it too. When someone was cleaning their gutters, they found it in the leaves there and sent me a picture and I was just so excited uh, to receive that one. But this one is called a plasmodiocarp. So if you break that word apart, plasmodio sounds a lot like plasmodium and carp meaning fruit actually, and it's sort of botanical root, like carpels and things. Um, so that's exactly what the name sort of describes in some ways what this fruiting body looks like. So in this case, instead of completely constricting into a, into a totally different shape, this one sort of constricts around the veins of the original plasmodium. So if we think about that picture I had on the very first slide when I was introducing myself, it's this sort of fan-shaped structure with sort of veins that run through it. And in this case, what it does is it, it constricts around those veins and then it dries and produces spores like I have on this little inset picture here. You can see it kind of popping open with those fuzzy structures um, and spores on the inside. Um, so the hematrichia serpula, which I have the two pictures on there, is is a super cool one and that's the only one that I've ever seen before as well. 
this diderma effusum, um, effusum, I think is what that's supposed to be, not effusima. Diderma effusum on the right-hand side, this one tends to grow on leaves. And I've seen not this species, but one that's similar. So in this case, this one's a little less net-like, um, but it still has some of those long curved um, shapes to them as well. So these can be simple, they can be branched, uh, but they usually tend to be sessile and pressed against the substrate um, and not, not so commonly stocked. All right. So I took you on sort of a mini tour there of slime mold fruiting bodies, but I want to come back to this, this life cycle here. Um, and mostly, I know these life cycles can be in some ways kind of cumbersome, maybe take you back to, to the days of taking a biology class. Um, and so, you know, maybe not eliciting all of the best memories here. But what I want to do is highlight the sort of transition from how do we get from a plasmodium to sporangia or a fruiting body in that case, how do we get between those, how do we get back to the plasmodium? What does this all look like? And where are all these sort of invisible steps of the life cycle that make slime mold so strange and hard to understand? Because um, we're really missing a big, a big portion of what's going on here. All right, so the sporangia themselves, well, in this case, um, but the fruiting bodies in general that I just showed you, the sole purpose of those is to make spores. So they come up to the surface of whatever substrate they're in to get into the air column in a way so that they can disperse their spores, probably mostly by wind, but also probably disturbance or insects, um, different things eating them. But they need to sort of interact in some ways with the, with the sort of broader terrestrial world to make that happen. So in the sporangia, they go through what's called meiosis. Um, and so if you're, if you're a science person, maybe that's important to you. They go through the certain type of cell division that makes haploid spores. So it's the same thing that goes on actually in our ovaries or our testes when they make these cells that have half of the genetic information, because the whole point is those are going to fuse with another one. So you have a whole complete set of genetic information. So this is what this sort of looks like. I'm showing you the sporangia of Physarum gravidum, and these images are taken by Peter McDonald. And this is a really wonderful picture of what that looks like under a microscope. So you can still see the original structure there, but if you can see those little brown dots, those are where the spores are at. So each of these little heads, usually they'll dry, so they'll have a variety of different ways. I could actually probably talk to you for 45 minutes about all the different ways that these little sporangial heads can break and do different things. There's that much nuance, but essentially they produce spores up there, they break open and they do specialized things to get those spores out of there. But that's what they look like. They're small, they're spherical, they're often ornamented, which let me show you a picture of kind of what that looks like. Uh, the fruiting body on the left-hand side is a little bit hard to see, um, but the spores on the right are a little bit more straightforward here. So when I say ornamented, usually they have some kind of little spikes or pattern or something on the outside of them. They look a lot like pollen, actually, in my opinion. Um, but they tend to be ornamented and they can vary in color. So they can go from completely colorless or hyaline um, to almost nearly black. And really, slime mold spores can be just about any color, except we've never found any that are blue or true green. So it's quite a diversity, not only in their fruiting body shapes, but also in what those are producing or their spores. So each of those spores will actually, you know, travel to new habitats in some way, right? Whether they're being carried on the wind, they're carried on the back or in the digestive tract of a slug or something. They're moving to new places, hoping to conquer the world, be successful, um, and, and find some good food, essentially. So each of these spores will crack open, and if it's in a suitable environment, it will germinate, and what you will have is a, actually like a little amoeba that comes out of it. So Amoebas are kind of cool. Maybe you remember those from bio class too, or that can be something else you put on your list to, to Google image or video would be even better. But essentially amoeba are these sort of like bag blob-like cells that move around their environment in a really interesting way. They have what are called like pseudopods, pseudo meaning fake, pod meaning foot. So it's like these fake feet that sort of pop out of the cell um, and maneuver them through the environment. Essentially, if you were to imagine like a human in a garbage bag trying to crawl around the floor, that's a lot like what an amoeba looks like when they're, when they're trying to move. This is so hard when I can't see your faces. You're probably all deadpan staring at me as I say these, these really, <laughs> really, really lame descriptions. Um, 
But so those amoebas, once they're in their environment, can do a variety of different things as well. If it's a particularly damp environment, they can actually develop flagella or these long whip-like tails that help them maneuver through a damp environment. If the environment's not really great, they can actually go into this cyst form where they're remaining dormant, waiting for conditions to improve. And once they do, they recrack open and another amoeba comes out, right? So they have these different varieties of things that are, that are going on and ways to respond to their environment. But when the time is right and the chemistry is there and they've met another haploid amoeba that has just enough genetic information, you know, to make them compatible partners, um, they'll actually go through sort of cytoplasmic fusion where they're, they're sort of the, the bag-like part of the cell that has all the gel and cytoplasm and stuff inside. Those will actually fuse together. So what we have now is we went from two different cells to one cell that has two little centers of genetic information or DNA from two different individuals, right? And that's pretty typical. We find that in the animal life cycle, fungal life cycle, et cetera. And similarly as well, then those nuclei will fuse into one. So it now has genetic information from two, two different sort of parent cells, if you will, that are now combined into one. After that, it'll start going through mitotic cell division where that nucleus will divide into separate nuclei. Um, and that's pretty consistent as well. But this is where things get a little bit different. And this is what makes slime molds sort of interesting in that way is that instead of usually when in other life cycles, when that cell goes or when that when that nucleus goes through division like that, the two cells will cleave and actually form two completely different cells. And in this image here where it says young plasmodium, it almost looks like that's going to happen. But what happens in these slime molds instead, and this is kind of similar to fungi, is that those cells actually stay together. So we're getting this nucleus that's dividing and dividing and those subset nuclei are dividing and dividing and dividing, but the cell itself is staying completely the same size and fused together. Or sure, not the same size, it's growing, but it's all staying fused together is what I mean to clarify. So what we end up with is this one single giant cell that's actually full of diploid nuclei. And that's how we get the plasmodium. So it seems crazy. And that's usually one of the like highlighting points about slime molds is that their plasmodium is this single giant cell that's moving through space and it has all these nuclei in it. We don't really see that in, in many other organisms. There are certain fungi, since you know this is all kind of fungal themed as well, and that's more of my background. There are certain fungi that won't lay down cell walls in between there. So you have these kind of larger expansive cells, but nothing like we see in the slime mold where you as a human can not only see the giant cell, but it can be like this big, right? I mean, I've seen plasmodia and mulch beds that are about this big, and that's even when they're starting to constrict and get smaller. So these things can be really, really, really large, which is really, really, really cool if you think about the cell size in pretty much any other organism, right? It's, it's super impressive. So once again, that forms into the plasmodium stage which is sort of the stage that's continuing to go around um, and feed as well. But we're also having feeding in these amoeba-like stages too. So it's just this really different life cycle where it's sort of these individual cells doing their own thing for a while, feeding, navigating through their environment. And then they start, then they start going through this more complicated cell division to create this giant plasmodium that can also move around as an individual organism. And that's something we don't see in many other life cycles at all. All right, so I have a video here too, because I talk about this, this plasmodium as moving through space. And it does so by this particular process called cytoplasmic streaming, where basically all of the jelly stuff inside the cell, the cytoplasm, it actually streams back and forth within this giant cell. And that's what sort of pushes it one way, pushes it another way pushes it another. Um, and it has ways of being able to determine when it wants to, wants to sort of grow one way, when there's sort of something beneficial over there, something attractive, and when it wants to sort of move away from something else like salt or something that it's not interested in. So I'll show you a video of what that looks like. Now this is a time lapse, so it doesn't move this fast, but these things actually do move pretty darn fast.
And you can see it starting to sort of separate and form potential fruiting bodies. You can see the little sporangial heads forming. And there's probably even a better view too. You can see the stalks forming. Awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that. There's lots of videos actually out there of cytoplasmic streaming and slime molds moving. Um, and so that's another thing to add to your list to, to Google image. But so I've sort of described, especially within this life cycle, right? I've described these as being almost animal-like, right? If you really, you're not, we're not just talking about like tigers and dogs and things. We're talking about amoeba and some of the other animals that we don't often consider. We have this sort of amoeba-like stage, which, you know, are these amoeba. They move like amoeba. They have all the morphology of amoebas. Um, they hunt their food down, right? They're actively seeking food and moving as a whole organism, not just growing towards something like a plant or even a fungus would, right? Where fungal hyphae are, are growing, but they're sort of staying in place. They're laying down something new, almost like a vining plant, right? Like it's growing towards something. It's not the whole organism getting up and necessarily moving through a space in search of food and good substrate and water and everything it needs to survive. So we have these really animal-like characteristics, but we also have these really fungal-like characteristics, especially in the, in the structures that we can see um, at the surface, right? Like a lot of their sexual reproduction structures look very, very fungal and operate very fungally. They reproduce by spores, they produce these stopped structures. I mean, it all looks pretty fungal. So I mean, what is going on here? We have these sort of animal and fungal-like things going on. And I hope you enjoy this picture of me as a mushroom. This was made by my friend, Andrew, which was just so great. So what is going on here and where do they sort of fall in line with other organisms that we know? So they're not animals, but they're also, like I said, not fungi and they're not at all plants. So like, what the heck, where did these things fall in? So I'm showing you, this just actually came out in 2020. This is the new tree of eukaryotes, which is what this paper is titled. Um, so I wanna put this into a little bit of context if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But first of all, if you're not super familiar with phylogenetic trees, which I, you know, I don't expect you to be, this is how you sort of read these and in put very, put very briefly here at least. So we're actually going to read this from the bottom of the tree here, where this first sort of point starts, up to the tips of the tree where all these names are. We're reading that through time. So the start of that tree is a really, really long time ago. And then where all those names are at, that's sort of the present day categorization and grouping of these organisms. So with that said, this orange star here, this would have been a divergence in species that happened a, long, a lot longer ago than where this red star is at, for example. Right. And this becomes kind of important in terms of placing these organisms. So as you can see up on the upper left here, this Archaeplastida group, that contains modern day plants, also green algaes, uh, red algaes, things into that, in that sort of large group there. So that's where our plants are at, if we're just going to talk some of these like groups that we're more familiar with. Over on the right upper side here, let's see if I can, here we go. Um, that's where this Apistheconta, which has a star next to it and these orange circles and lines, that's where we have not only animals, as we know all of them, but also fungi. So animals and fungi are actually really closely related. I'm not sure if you'll attend any other events that talk more about this, but they're actually pretty darn closely related. Like you can see within this whole tree of eukaryotic life, meaning all organisms that aren't bacteria and archaea and little tiny things like that, um, Fungi and animals are actually super closely related that they're within the same group. Slime molds, however, are in this sort of what we call like a sister group that branches off here at this red star. So they're actually pretty darn closely related as well, which would explain why we see many animal-like characteristics and structures as well as fungal-like characteristics and, and structures. But you can see it was way back at this orange kind of rust-colored star that plants and other organisms over here split off. So the next time you see a fungus, you know, it's basically, it's like not that distant of a cousin, especially if it's growing on mulch and in, near some shrubs and things. Those are much distant, more distant family. Your fungi, your mushrooms, and your slime molds. Now those are, those are high quality close cousins. 
and I include this as well for folks, if you have any kind of background in slime molds, perhaps you're interested in this as well. Um, this is a different take on somewhat the same tree here. This was in 2017, but I'm gonna zoom in on this left-hand side here. So where that red arrow is at, these are the slime molds that we're talking about today. When I showed you that life cycle and I pointed out that this was a plasmodial slime mold, I did that for a reason because we're talking about actually even one group of slime molds. And it's most of the slime molds that you're gonna see if you're out in the woods doing anything, but there's other groups that kind of fall into this group of slime molds um, that are a little bit different. So if this is something you become interested in or are currently interested in and pursue this more, you'll run into this where they talk about cellular slime molds, which I have sort of circled there in the blue, which split off of the off of the acellular slime molds or plasmodial slime molds. But that contains like the dictyostelids or the dictyostelomycetes, which I think is what they're now calling it. Um, and a lot of what, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, just highlighted a bit, but some of the more like human-based applications that we use slime molds for, those are actually the cellular slime molds. So when we're talking about using them in a laboratory setting, um, if we're using them as a model organism, we're probably talking about um, dictyostelium, which falls into that group. So slightly different, mostly their life cycle just looks different, which is actually pretty major, but um, they also still exist out in the woods. You're just not gonna see them like you will the plasmodial ones. Um, but they're doing all kinds of ecological benefits, eating bacteria and doing all kinds of things as well, living in the soil. Um, this other group in yellow is called the Serratiomycetes. And that has some species that you might see out as well, but mostly just putting that into context if that's sort of your cup of tea and that's what you're here for. All right. So like I said, I spent actually quite a bit of time talking about what they are. And I did that on purpose because I don't think that at least in my experience talking to people about slime molds, um, not many people come in even having an idea of like what these organisms are. Oftentimes they think they're a mold or a fungus, which makes a lot of sense, right? We actually did for a really long period of human history, um, but they're actually not that, right? Um, there's something kind of different. Uh, they're kind of animal-like, kind of fungal-like. They're closely related to us, but they're so beautiful and they can look a variety of different ways. I want to spend a little bit of time though, and I probably won't nearly do them the justice of what they deserve in some of these next sections, but I also want to talk a little bit about what they do, right? Like what are they out there doing? Um, and also a little bit about where we'll find them. So some general notes about slime mold ecology. Um, first, before I get started on this actually, there's a lot about slime mold ecology that we don't know. So another reason why I won't be talking as long about it is that there's not as much that we have to say. It's a little easier to find them and look at them under a scope and describe them and categorize them. And now that we have access to DNA information and things, we can sort of try and put them into the family tree a little better. Works great. But in terms of their ecology, especially outside of a lab Petri dish, it's really hard to say um, what all they're doing out there. They're just, you know, they're living as free amoeba most of the time, so it's even hard to know where they're at, um, but certainly hard to, to get a good grasp about what they're doing in natural systems. One thing we do know is that they tend to occur, occur where bacteria and fungi are plentiful, and there's a lot of evidence showing that they feed on bacteria as well as fungi um, in, a, in a variety of different ways and contexts, I guess. Um, so in that, we're sort of inferring that they have some kind of role in the balance of microbial communities in different systems and in different substrates. And they probably also have an impact on decomposition of things as well. So we often find them on damp logs and things. And if they're maintaining some kind of balance within the microbial community, whether that's between bacteria and fungi, if they're sort of specialists on one of those groups or the other, um, even within species of that too, if they focus on certain bacterial species or other fungal species, they're probably impacting all of these microbial interactions too by mediating the community in some way. Um, but they also can do other certain cool things, or I guess this is sort of a little bit of a, um, an add on to that. There was this really cool 1974 study that actually showed that slime molds, as they're eating bacteria, once they start to create their fruiting bodies, particularly the sporangia, they can actually exude all of those remaining bacterial bodies and parts and compounds that they didn't need and want out in that stock part. So it's not up there in the in the spores, contaminating the spores, it's sort of in the structural part, which I thought was just like absolutely amazing and so cool that we knew that in 1974, but yet we're still trying to figure out like what these organisms do. Um, so they feed primarily on bacteria and fungi. And the two that I'm showing you here, this or these two pictures, they're actually the same slime mold species. 
This is Physarum polycephalum. Um, and this one is thought to be primarily fungivorous, meaning it only feeds on fungi. And that would make sense because I found it on wood and things too, which would have fungi, but I tend to find it on, in this left-hand picture, this is a type of oyster mushroom, uh, Pleurotus pulmonarius. And I tend to find it on there actually quite a bit, but I've also found it a decent amount on the jelly ear, wood ear fungus, Auricula americana, I think is what it is now. Um, so you can see I found some of that in the wild and it's usually on fungi. There's also some really cool stuff, um, and I wish I had more time to talk about this, but there's certain beetle species that we actually only know and have only found um, in slime mold fruiting bodies. So particularly athalia, which are those big juicy cushions just full of spores, and the beetles are just embedded in there, like going to town eating a bunch of those like fatty filled, nutrient rich spores. Um, this one in particular is Anastoma horni, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and you can see it's just covered in these spores here. Um, and it's the only place we found that one. And there's another species as well that are in this sort of group called the slime mold beetles. There's also certain slime molds that we know that only associate with bryophytes. And when I say that, what I'm meaning are mosses and liverworts, which are tiny, tiny, tiny little plants that can grow in the cracks on sidewalks or on rocks. Um, and so you can see this one here, it's called the tiger spot slime mold. And you can see it's growing right on a little bed of, that actually looks like a liverwort there and not a moss. So they're doing cool things and they have cool partnerships, but there's a lot more that we actually are hoping to learn about that. All right, so a bit about where to find them. And this actually kind of relates to their ecology, right? Like I'm talking about what they're feeding on and these relationships that they have. And so this sort of translates nicely into where you would find them. So if they're eating bacteria and fungi, they're gonna be growing on and in substrates that they're finding a lot of bacteria and fungi. So wood being one of those examples, rotting logs is an excellent place to find them. Um, also mulch beds, especially if you're looking for Fulago, Septica, the dog vomit slime mold, that is your place to look. Um, yes, if you haven't seen that one, take walks downtown Madison uh, during the summer and, and you'll undoubtedly see something that looks, you know, either like this bright yellow plasmodial stage or more commonly this sort of tan, dry, crusty stage. Um, they can also grow on leaves as well. And there's this really miraculous picture up here that I didn't take. I did, I did steal that one off the internet. I'm sorry, but um, it's just beautiful here. You can see all those little sporangia just lining um, the veins of that leaf right along the outside. And then this one at the bottom here was actually one that I did take. And I mean, maybe this just highlights how much of a nerd I am, but I thought this was extremely amazing. So I found this like pile of unknown animal scat because I deal with fungi and slime molds, not not animals, no idea what this is, but there was a slime mold growing out of it. So once again, that makes sense. Bacteria and fungi, where are they going to be? They're going to be an animal scat. So there's a cute little slime mold there for you. Probably the highlight of this talk. Oh, one thing I wanted to add to this though, is that they tend to grow in places where there's adequate moisture. Um, so you'll also like fungi, you'll find them after a rainfall event or something like that most. Um, but the places that I've had the most luck where I first started seeing these a lot was just taking my dog walking in like shallow creek beds. As you walk along there, there's wood, there's things that are um, leaves, all kinds of damp debris, and that's where you'll find a lot of these really lovely structures. Oops. All right. Um, so could it really get any better than this, right? I think an image of a slime mold growing on scat is kind of the, the apex of where we're going for this week. But I have a few things just in case you're not impressed at this point. Um, so slime molds have been used in a lot of like what we would consider from a human aspect, like broader applications. So um, I have the little Petri dish there, which is showing an experiment involving a dictyostelid, which is a cellular slime mold. I recognize I highlighted it's different than what we're talking about here, but kind of falls into this general group of slime molds. And that's been used as a model system in, in a lot of laboratory-based experiments. So a lot of genetic experiments, um, and I think other things as well. So that's, that's used oftentimes in lab settings. So it's kind of behind the scenes of a lot of things we know about a lot of different things. Um, the lower picture there, which shows that yellow Physarum polycephalum growing on a map across the United States, uh, it's actually been used in a lot of different um, social studies and things as well. Um, where these slime molds have been effectively able to match historical trade routes, um, current interstate and subway routes. They're basically really good as if you put like a little piece of oatmeal at like a, at a big city or a travel hub, they'll find the most efficient route 
to get to those. Once they're allowed to grow across that substrate, they create these sort of main veins between those different food sources, and they essentially map different routes of transportation. So that can be sort of useful. I read about one study that was particularly useful. They mapped it kind of similarly to what they did here. Um, but in one of the areas, they put salt, which is a deterrent for Physarum polycephalum. They put that in an area where there's like a nuclear plant or something to sort of highlight like what would happen if there was a nuclear event or some kind of event at this place where all of a sudden traffic needed to be rerouted in different ways, or this was an, an area you want to avoid essentially. And the slime mold was able to, you know, figure out these other efficient routes of transportation. And so, as I understand it, these are used by engineers, um, historians, and things like that to study different things as well. Um, the picture on the right here is actually from a Wired uh, magazine article that was talking about how slime molds are also used to create mathematical models as ways of under better understanding cancer and trying to figure out ways that we can starve cancer using them as the driver of the mathematical model. This is definitely over my head. I can talk about the biology of slime molds, but this application stuff is really, really groovy um, and lots of cool stuff there. They've also been used by engineers as ways of studying like self-organizing systems, which probably permeates into some of this. So a quick anecdote, there was one time I was at um, like a restaurant and they ended up talking to someone and they said they studied slime molds. And you can imagine I'm just like, gushing with enthusiasm here. I'm just so excited. And it turns out they were like in an engineering department. We couldn't understand each other talking almost whatsoever. But it was super cool to meet someone who was using slime molds, not at all interested in their biology, but in this way of studying self-organizing systems as a way to translate things into business models. Like that's about all I can even say of what they did. Anyways, it was super, super cool. They also have been very recently, um, and I'm highlighting a couple papers here, one that just came out in 2021 and one in 2020, um, that they've been this sort of like more recently looked at source of antibiotics, which is becoming a really, really important aspect of our future as humans um, as well. Um, granted, COVID was a viral thing, but like in terms of that, I think it kind of um, resonates with where we're at in terms of of needing to needing to understand our medical situations at this point. Anyways, it was a really, really couple interesting studies here um, showing that showing that we're able to actually find novel antibiotics um, and novel compounds from these slime molds. So the first image, if I go back here, moving too quickly, this was the graphical abstract of one of the papers highlighting three of the new compounds that were found there. And this one here um, is showing the, this was sort of a mini review. It's highlighting the breakdown by different genera of slime molds of where we tend to find these more novel compounds. and then showing some of the ones that we get from pigments as well. So we can get them from pigments and non-pigments. Um, if any of you are out there that are interested in this, Nancy Keller, I don't know if you're out there, but this would be something super fun to talk about sometime. They were also used, I guess maybe I have like two minutes. I'll just play this very shortly. This was also used in some kind of a, a study here as well, where they actually used Fisarum with these electrodes to make uh, electronic music. So as this is growing, it's stimulating the, the sort of electrodes and that's what's creating this music. It's a minute and a half though, so I'll let you all watch that at home on your own time. I know that's what you'll be doing this weekend, so. And just finally here, I also want to note that Physarum polycephalum, which I've talked about a lot, is kind of like the, the sort of poster children of, or poster child of slime molds, is actually one that you can cultivate really easily at your house. Um, so you can buy kits online or little sclerotia, if you remember me talking about that, those hardened little masses that they can mail to you and you can actually do this at home. But these are certain ones that I grew from some of those collections that I found um, on the oyster mushrooms or on the whittier mushrooms. Uh, you really just need a little piece they'll grow on the bacteria and fungi that exist on your oatmeal, but you can give them obviously like I did here, pieces of enrichment, like a little soggy piece of wood. Um, but you can you can continue to propagate them and just take a little piece of that plasmodium and you can, you can make new ones. So I've done this with biology classes before. This one in the giant jar was Big Dan and he was around for a long time and made many little and smaller and micro dan so I, I propagated a lot from that one uh but yeah they're super fun if you have kids at home it's particularly a fun activity because these things aren't dangerous at all um i mean obviously don't eat it if you you know but but overall they're not dangerous at all the worst thing is that they will quickly grow out of your container so just make sure that you don't have any good food sources lying around that they will they will find quickly 
And with that, I want to thank you all so much for your time. I think I could have talked about this for hours. It was super hard to know where to cut, where to cut myself off in some ways. Um, and I thank you for your interest and time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, I think my sound is still on here. Let me double Okay, great. Um, oh, it looks like I maybe had a couple of questions in the chat from earlier. Let me start at the top here. All right, so someone saw one of these in the summer and didn't know what it was. One of the ones, I'm wondering which one that is, if you want to speak up. Super cool. Um, I'm glad you were able to see one. So maybe you've seen at least two slime molds in your life. That's pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, Brad had a question, does that include all of Protista? My guess is that was when we were looking at the phylogenetic tree. And yes, so I, I actually didn't use that word protist, um, which I think Protista, the actual as a taxonomic group has been sort of phased out, especially with this new paper that came out in 2020. But the word protist, which is kind of from Protista, but it's a more general term that Protist is used to describe any kind of organism that's not a plant, a fungus, or an animal, which those used to be the sort of like supergroups within eukarya or the eukaryotes. Um, and I still use the word protist. I think it's it actually has a lot of uh, good meaning if you're talking about any of those other groups. And in that case, yes, slime molds fall into the protist group, which are eukaryotes, meaning they're not bacteria or archaea. They actually have membrane-bound um, organelles and a nucleus. Uh, but they, they don't fall into those main groups, and so they fall into this catch-all group called protists, which aren't necessarily all related. They sort of intersperse between, like, plants over here, fungi, animals over here. Um, but yes, they fall into that group. Great question. Um, some positive words. Thank you so much for your time and for attending. Are any of them edible? Uh, Scott, wonderful question. And that was something actually I wish I would have had a little bit more time to put something in about um, or to look into more. In short, I've only read something very short about that. Um, it's it's actually Fuligoseptica was one of the ones listed and then there's another one. Um, but certain stages of the plasmodium is actually harvested by indigenous communities in Mexico, or at least was uh, historically, and and was consumed. But I have no other information in terms of, you know, what that stage was of the plasmodium. Is it when it was starting to constrict? My guess is when it was obviously not producing a bunch of spores. Um, but there there had to have been some kind of processing or something, you know, in terms of eating that. I think it said it was maybe like cooked. Well cooked in some way. That's about all the information I have. But yes, great question. And it sounds like there is there is at least some information on that up there. What are my favorite Instagram slime mold pages? Good question. So I just got Instagram not terribly long ago. So I feel like I'm still I'm still getting still figuring it out. So I can't actually like place any handles off the top of my head. I know there is one called Slime Mold Sunday, and that's a hashtag that's used by a, a number of mushroom fungi people that I follow. Um, so that would be a good place to start. Uh, I would say though, I can comment more to Facebook. <laughs> um, and there's a group called like the Slime Mold Identification and Appreciation Group. And that is actually a really stellar resource and really, really great people, um, really wonderful people. So the images that I got up there were ones that I used from there, but that's a great place to ask questions. And there's some of the slime mold experts from the United States, like Fred Spiegler, I think I'm saying his last name right. Um, I think, I believe he's a member in that group too. So you can, you know, it's not, not that the common folks don't know anything about that either, but people who have dedicated their entire lives to studying slime molds are commenting on these two, which is really fantastic. Yeah, I wish I would have had a little bit more time to comment on, you know, some of the some of the like other broader applications or, or even some of the like things that are brought up in pop sci articles as well, what some people are using some of these slime molds to try and study or do. Um, there's just a lot out there. In some ways, I focused a little bit more on the like, what are they and biology side of it. One, because that's like kind of what my background is and where my interests lie. But two, because I think when, if you become interested in these and you're reading any articles online from like the New York Times or Wired Magazine or Smithsonian, um, 
that's the kind of stuff you're going to run into is more of the 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 pop culture stuff is like what they're being used for. So I hope this gives like some kind of a framework to ground and base some of that. Like when they're talking about a plasmodium, if they even use that word, like what that is, how it relates to the spore producing structures, hopefully you'll have some of that background. Um, but really, as I was designing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I could, I could talk about this forever. So where do I even, where do I draw the line here? But oh, Lauren, thanks for attending. Yeah, it's good to see you in here. Let's see, oops, I missed one here. Do slime molds compete or support each other in habitation? That's a really good question. Um, and what that brings to mind for me is actually, it kind of depends perhaps on whether we're talking about plasmodial slime molds, which is mostly what I highlighted here, versus cellular slime molds. So I was actually hoping to talk a little bit more about cellular slime molds and show you their life cycle and how it differs, but there was just not gonna be, I think, enough time to do that. Um, so I have read a few things about uh, cellular slime molds where it gets really crazy. Um, so it's sort of this like self-organizing, if you view that in some ways of like sort of a, a supportive way, um, where there's this chemical signaling and it involves them all coming like coming together into these swarm cells uh, to create these structures. But there's also these sort of like internal dynamics that go on in terms of which cells end up becoming just like part of the fruiting body versus which ones actually make it up into that top little sporangial part to become a spore that reproduces, right? Like, cause if you're the, if you're the nucleus in a way, right, that just becomes the stalk, your reproductive potential, at least for that particular nucleus is nothing, right? And so given that they have this individual life as individual amoeba, but yet they have this sort of collective life as well, the stage of their life, it becomes particularly interesting. Um, and I wish I could speak maybe even more directly to it, uh, but I just remember reading that there's these interesting internal dynamics of like ways that certain cells, especially if it's like a cell that's not of the same species can actually parasitize these fruiting bodies and they can actually bypass and, and sort of put other ones in a position in line that they have to be the sort of stock of the fruiting body or the outer cover, but they sort of channeled their way up into being spores, which is crazy, right? Like it's just, it's, there's already so much that's kind of like wild about these organisms and seemingly unknown, but there's all of these weird little kind of like mutualistic and competitive dynamics, even within a species, even within like a, what becomes an individual, right? It's, it's just mind blowing. Um, and if you're interested in that, there's a book called The Social Amoeba, by, is it John Bonner, Taylor, John Taylor Bonner? I think that's his name. Bonner is the last name. Um, but that book is all about uh, cellular slime molds. And it's been a while since I've read that, but that was where, where a lot of this information is coming from, so. Um, when is it believed that the first slime mold evolved? Excellent question. And also something I guess I didn't put in there, um, which would have been interesting on that tree. So I believe they were thought to have evolved about like a billion years ago, um, which to put some of that in context, especially if I have the number right, um, it was about once we started to think that things were existing on land, um, which kind of makes sense because I had a slide in there. Actually, I didn't get a chance to get into as much as I wanted the slide that showed up briefly that said distribution. Um, I wanted to sort of see if there was a good picture or something highlighting at least the distribution of one species or something. Because in essence, a lot of these species are actually circumboreal. Like they're found everywhere around the globe, but maybe restricted to like a particular set of latitude lines or something. Most of them actually occur in temperate regions. I think that's, yeah, most of them occur there, which to me, I find kind of surprising, but um, you know, you always tend to think of, think of things as being like more so in the tropics. And I think there's certain groups that are more prevalent in the tropics, but there's actually quite a lot of them in, in temperate regions as well. But you tend to find them everywhere. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily like they're restricted to one small geographic area. I think that's true for some species, but broadly speaking, you know, if we call something Fuligo septica here, it is actually the same species as Fuligo septica halfway across the world. So it's pretty cool. Um, but yes, they were thought to have evolved essentially around the time that that life was moving to land. So pretty, pretty old beings here as well. Oh, in terms of what is the evidence of that? That's a good question. Gosh, um, I'm trying to remember kind of when and where I read that and what, what sort of grounded that in a way. 
I'd have to revisit that one to know what they were sort of basing a lot of that off of. I mean, my guess is it's pretty similar to how they do it with, you know, other organisms in a way, even just looking at like probably distribution and, and genetic architecture archetypes as well. So do they compete against lichens or other mushrooms for, for nutrition? Excellent question. Um, so lichens are particularly interesting when it comes to nutrition because they've, they are fungi that have essentially chosen, no, not chosen. They've essentially adopted this sort of lifestyle where they, they form symbiotic relationships with usually green algae, but sometimes cyanobacteria, which can photosynthesize as well. Um, but with some kind of small photosynthetic organism that they build and incorporate right into their body. So other fungi, things that, you know, produce mushrooms and stuff like that, they have other ways of getting nutrition, whether it be breaking down wood or the loaf of bread that's sitting at the back of your cupboard, or maybe they associate with tree roots underground and they get carbon from, from plants. Lichens actually are kind of doing it in this way of they've incorporated the, the plants, if you will, the algae into their body, and they're sort of getting, um, getting carbohydrates and things from, from algae that way. And like I said, with fungi, they're getting it from other substrates. So in short, I would say on the whole, slime molds and lichens and mushrooms are not necessarily competing with each other because they're not after the same food resources. However, slime molds, especially the Physarum polycephalum that I showed you, is actively digesting fungi. So they're competing not necessarily for the same like nutritional resources, but the one is actually trying to consume the other one. So they're certainly like competing in that way as in like they're at sort of different even trophic levels in some way. Um, fungi are trying to break down organic matter and actually eat like dead plant and animal matter and things like that, whereas slime molds are trying to eat bacteria and fungi. So, so they're just at different spots within that trophic network, but probably competing for space and probably other resources, even like moisture or um, they probably have chemical deterrents potentially for each other too. Um, certainly fungi are good at producing a lot of secondary metabolites and things that can be used as defense compounds so that maybe slime molds can't eat them. So there's, there's definitely some kind of interplay. There's an ecology going on between all of those groups of organisms we're talking about, but I don't know that it necessarily comes down to like fighting for the same food resource. Yeah. Excellent question though. Um, and these are things I think too, like the more I got into this, I'm certainly an ecologist at heart. And so finding a system that's so beautiful and visually appealing, but also like we don't know a ton about their ecology that just like makes me so excited. Um, so I think our hour is up, unfortunately, and I hate to end the fun because this was so interesting, but <laughs> I want to thank you, Kathleen, for being here and thank you everybody for coming. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share? I just want to extend another round of thank you for your time and your hopefully enthusiasm as well. Um, if you want to reach me at all, I think my, my email is available online through our UW lab website. If you search Kathleen Thompson, UW Madison, uh, you should be able to find my email address on there, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I, I hope this inspires you all to, to look for some slime molds. I, I hope you email me some pics. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you.